studio. I'm very pleased to have such a great crowd here this afternoon. We've had great attendance all day. And I'm very pleased, especially to welcome Lynn Wadsworth, uh, a dear friend of mine, a special import from St. Paul, Minnesota. And she's going to give an artist talk for about 10 or 15 minutes. And um, she'll keep it short. <laughs> and she, these beautiful collages are hers. They're called Selvages. And she was awarded a state grant, a grant from the Minnesota State Arts Board to create a book out of them. And uh, the ladies, her ladies, the clay sculptures over there, also arrived with her from Minnesota. And they, you'll probably tell us a little bit about that also. Yeah, we will. And then um, we're just going to have a short little dialogue afterwards about some common threads of our work between Bill uh, Casper, William Casper, his figurative sculpture, sculpture, and then my my other partner, my other half, Chris Malcolmson, and myself. And so with, with that, we'll turn it over to Lynn. Thank you. Oh, I've, let's see. I'm going to use some notes because I'm, I'm unlike Virginia, who was a professor at the, uh, an art professor. She's used to talking about her work and about to students. I am not, so I need some notes to talk to you, especially for 10 minutes, right? Um, but first I want to thank you guys for coming. I want to thank Virginia and Chris for giving me this opportunity and um, all of you for being here. And I'd like to thank my husband for helping me schlep all this stuff out here, okay? So I'm an artist I, I, that's worked in several mediums and two of them are here today, the clay sculpture, and the collages. And um, I think the medium is integral to the meaning of the work. So a lot of times I will select a medium that will go with the idea that I have. And we'll talk a little bit about that, especially when I talk about the ceramic sculpture. But in my work, in general, I feel that I'm trying to reveal hidden meanings, expose contradictions, and under, examine the underpinnings of cultural construction through juxtaposition, humor, and invention. Humor is especially important to me um, in this. I invite the viewers to see things in a new way, and I think that that's what all the best art does, is it helps um, us see things in a new way. So as I said, I have two bodies of, two bodies of work, and I'm gonna talk first about the collages. Collage is what I think a really generous and accessible medium. Anybody can do it. All it takes is um, very few materials, uh, paper, scissors, and glue. And in fact, the word collage comes from the word, the French word collie for glue. I first looked at collage seriously when I was studying film as an undergraduate. And I was exposed to the work of Joseph Cornell who some of you may be familiar with. He made amazing assemblages and um, also amazing collages, but he also made films. And I think it's not hard to see film as a kind of collage in that you're putting images together to build a bigger thing. Other, thing, other traditions of collage that I look to are cubism, dadaism, surrealism, Robert Rauschenberg's combines, and Miriam Shapiro's uh, femages. So about 20 years ago, I had a day job and I had limited time to be in the studio and my studio space was a bedroom in my house. And I was trying to think, what can I do in this space? And so I started really focusing on these small portable collages, using the printed page as my paint, um, my source of color, form, pattern, and light. I'm especially drawn in these um, printed pages to magazines that uh, are women's magazines that have, are chock full of printed fabrics and wallpaper, and then also to travel magazines or even National Geographic, things that have lush, um, lush pictures of faraway locations. But often what I do is, when I have these pages, is I cut away um, the main part of the image, so what the picture is actually of, and I use the background 
things that I find in the background um, to use in my collages. Early on, I decided that the collages were to be only cut and paste, that all the images would remain as they are found. Right now, you see so many people taking um, images and resizing them and changing them all around in Photoshop. I don't use any digital processes. I embrace the glue smudges, the visual edges, and the um, wrinkled paper. I think they reveal the materials, of course, but they also reveal the maker's hand, and that's important to me. Over time, over these 20 years that I've been making these small collages, um, they've matured from what I would say is an early aping of surrealist imagery. And by that I mean, if you're familiar with like John Hartfield or Hannah Hawk or even Max Ernst, um, I, I think my early collages, I really you know, look to them for direction. But since then, I feel like I've come on to my own language that's pretty, idios it's pretty abstract if you look at the collages and pretty idiosyncratic. However, even though the printed objects, like I said, I usually choose things in the background, but even though they're obscured, they're maybe out of focus because they're in the background, they're obscured, I feel that they retain their identity as part of the world. And they carry the meaning of, the, of what they represent into the collages. And with this, that you create this sort of multiple layers of meaning, a thickness of content and form that isn't meant to tell. It's not meant to tell you what to think or how to look at it, but I think it reveals as you look at it. And so it's like you look at a collage and you'll get a glimpse of something. It may form an impression. And this impression um, asks you to connect the dots because I'm not telling you how to connect the dots. I do offer titles, and the titles may suggest a place to begin with the collages. So with the collages, after doing them for quite a while, and literally I have hundreds of them, um, <laughs> um, I, had an, I decided to create a visual narrative with the collages. So that's what my book Salvages is here, and you can take a look at it if you want. Um, but it's a, it's a narrative that's only pictures, it has titles to the pictures, but it doesn't tell you a story. It's up to you to create the story. And to do this, my approach could be considered somewhat backwards. Um, for most books, the story comes first and the illustrations or images are created afterwards. In this case, the collages came first, and then um, I looked for rapport between the collages, color relationships, rhythm in the images, and also common themes in their titles. And that's how I started creating the chapters, or what I would call poems, in uh, visual poems in the book. And I think, you know, when you have a group of works together, they stand up and they lean on each other and they become a whole. So you get these, these whole poems in, um, in the book versus an individual work, which is stands on its own, of course. But um, I'm hoping that you'll find an evocative poetry if you look at the book. So that's, that's the collages, and that's my book. And I'll talk a little bit shortly about um, what I call my coarsely fashioned beauties. Um, my ceramic sculpture over here. I don't consider myself a ceramicist. Um, I don't really feel like I know enough about ceramics. Ceramics is not simple. Unlike collage, which only has like three pieces of materials, ceramics has many processes and many materials. You could start at five years old and go to 105 and still not learn everything there is to learn about ceramics. There is so much material science involved. And in fact, I worked in ceramics for five years before I even started creating any art 
in ceramics because I just felt there was so much to learn. Um, there's the how to shape something out of clay, the different kinds of clay, the different kinds of slips, the different kinds of um, glazes, how to fire it, the different kinds of firings, and then of course the magic that happens in the kiln. So, as I said, coarsely fashioned beauties. Partly this is because they're made out of, they're hand built sculptures, they're made with my hands, they're not made on a wheel, so they are lumpy. <laughs> And um, I started that, but I'm gonna step back for a second. The impetus for this work was I was thinking about contemporary culture. And I was thinking about our obsession with celebrity and fashion. And how that, our period really resonates with the Rococo period in, in that way. And that led me to think about the excess of the Rococo hairdos that, um, women in the Rococo period, period had huge hairdos with all kinds of goo and ships or dolls or animals in their hairdos. And um, I thought about, wouldn't it be kind of fun to make these out of clay? And uh, it's kind of a humorous idea to think of making a hairdo out of clay because clay is really hard and hair is very soft. But nonetheless, I did these sculptures, and I feel like these sculptures are very female. Um, there are female forms in which the hair becomes a trope that is both an enticing illusion and a catalog of its own artifice. They're literally made out of mud. They're made out of red earthenware. They're earthy and humble. And like I said, marks from the maker's hands are all over them, and they're and emphasizing their, fo their foibles. Well, one of them in particular looks like it's gonna fall over at any time. Um, so, low-fire low earthenware, I, I, I just wanna say, for those of you who don't know clay, is a, a, as opposed to porcelain, which is a, a more refined and delicate medium that allows you to create much finer works, so, you know, like you can think of teacups. But I feel like this, this is the perfect medium to work with these in, and it underlines the uh, playful tension at the center of this work. So, I will take questions later. I know Virginia and everyone's gonna have something to say, and I hope you'll enjoy the show, and thanks for coming. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Wow, lot to think about. Thank you. Well, I'm always so amazed. I was really interested in Lynn talking about how she was using sort of the background pieces of the photographs. And um, it's like you're really into negative space. <laughs> you know, my favorite word. Yes. But we're going to have a little dialogue. Bill and Chris are going to come up. Yeah. And um, as soon as Chris returns, we can get back here. Um, we were thinking about, you know, one of the common threads between our work, here we are, are showing together and exhibiting these works, and the work all looks very different and individual in characters. But I really go back to this, um, this statement of Lynn's where she talks about examining the underpinnings of cultural construction through juxtaposition, and that she invites the viewer to see things in a new way. And as you said, that's what the best art does. And that's really what all four of us do. Um, and I just wanted us each to respond to talk about how you do that, how you see about what you're presenting to the viewer and think about translating things in a new way. Why don't we start with Bill? Sure. Um, as a figurative sculptor, I'm dealing with a three-dimensional medium, which is static. It doesn't move, and yet I'm always trying to impart movement and emotion. So, although they're not collages, but I do have a reveal. And the reveal is the tension that's within the sculpture's pose that I'm trying to impart. So, for me, the juxtaposition is something that's motionless and imparting some sense of movement. For example, in uh, yoga poses, even though they 
tend to look uh, placid, holding a pose. We know that in yoga, um, there's lots of energy, strength, holding that pose underneath. Um, so the juxtaposition is this static sculpture, but you know that the model who's holding it, or the pose, has a lot of dynamism going on underneath that. Um, and I tend to uh, present that movement by texturing the surfaces, um, trying to get light to go around the sculptures to emphasize movement. Um, and I would say that that's how I present what I'm feeling, and that's my message. My message, I hope, comes through. Clearly, it's in the eye of the beholder, um, but that's my vision. It was interesting. We uh, were talking yesterday about Bill has two large heads that are flanking the front door on pedestals. But really, there was a dialogue between the ladies over here and Bill's heads. You know, how did you see that dialogue, Lynn? Well, I, I, I just I love the when Bill brought those sculptures in because to me, I said, oh, those those your work and my work are really going to talk to each other today. <laughs> you know, the shape is similar. But also, there's an energy and a personhood in both of those. Yeah, yeah. it's exciting. And how about you, Chris? How do you present things in a new way to the viewer? Okay. Um, I wanted to say, really, that um, I'm not an artist, I'm actually a maker. And my background is being a civil engineer, and there are a lot of buildings standing up, amazingly. And uh, I have worked 30 years with architects and so on, so that I'm coming from a different kind of place. I've always needed to be creative because uh, it does help one's sanity. Uh, and so that it's really important for me to do that. So I just come back from London, I came back on Thursday, and uh, when I was sitting on the plane, I thought, Oh, I've got to do something. So I often write haiku. Not very well, but the thing about haiku is that 575 is okay in English because it's totally different to the Japanese. So you can do what you like, particularly in America, if you read the American books on haiku. So here was one sitting on the plane, flying through the air at 36,000 feet. What? No angels. <laughs> so it's fun to be creative and to write I, I started painting um, in about 1980 when my marriage broke up and uh, I started doing uh, travel diaries with watercolour and um, I then uh, in 1990 the world fell apart and there was a huge slump in England and 5,000 engineers like me looking for a job and after painting walls for about three years, because I didn't have any money, I realized that actually I lived in Chelsea, and I could go to Chelsea Art School in London for peanuts. Uh, and that's when I decided to commit myself to painting. And uh, so I went there. I only did a year there, uh, because by the time I'd done the foundation year, I was quite old. And. Um, <coughs> It was there that I learned to paint abstract. I was really lucky that I then moved from there into a block of studios where there were about 120 people in this old railway building. And um, that was really helpful because there were people being creative and were prepared to be helpful. And we had a rule that you didn't comment on anybody's work unless you were asked. I, um, I would, uh, you know, ask people about once a month what they thought. They'd come into the studio and say, well, I give it up if I were you. I mean, a clear, there were clear, helpful uh, remarks. Gradually, uh, with developing in painting, being in the studio, I began to realise that actually what I wanted to do, and what I've been trying to do ever since, is to provide paintings that actually add to people's lives. So that 
what I'm aiming for all the time, and I believe sometimes achieve, is a kind of tranquility. And more and more, I um, also people think my work is like Rothko's in a kind of way. But what Rothko does is he draws gateways. And what I'm thinking of more is what might happen on the other side of the gateway. And what I've tried to do is to make um, paintings that you can stand in front of and move about anywhere in yourself. And um, I think that's enough. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. So that, that leads to me. Um, I think a lot about my work is sort of being on the peripheral, sort of like, you know, today in society, we've got our phones in front of us all the time. And I'm thinking about, instead of what's in front of you, it's sort of what's seeping through the air or what's sort of in the outer perimeter that you may not notice to begin with. Uh, something that Kate said to me, um, I'm happy to say one of my works found a new home with Kate and Greg last weekend. But she said, you know, it's interesting, Greg likes landscape painting and I like abstract paintings. And your paintings operate on both levels, and so we're both happy with the painting. Mm -hmm. But I see that, that it's sort of like I'm unearthing what's behind the canvas as I work through the process, or I'm building on top of the canvas and then taking away. And you know, as you live with one of my paintings, they keep changing. They're that that negative space, you know, <laughs> that negative space. There's always something new that in the atmosphere that starts to emerge. And that's, you know, that's the great mystery of painting for me, that it's always about process and making this painting and having a dialogue with it that I'm not trying to control, and, and yet it doesn't control it. You want to work in equilibrium and go down this path with the painting, and hopefully at some point the viewer comes along and takes a look around. Yeah. And also what's behind me, too, you know, not just what's in front of me. So... That's about it in a nutshell for me. And, um, thank you all for coming. And special thanks to Tasia for <laughs> arranging this Instagram Live today and her patience with these artists. <laughs> it's and, a pleasure. Um, and thank you all for being here. Mark. Yes, I have a question that's really for Bill, but it's really for all of the artists in front of me. I, I was listening to what Bill was saying about the sculpture and the process that he goes through. And my question really is, you know, a stand-up comedian, when he's talking to his audience, he needs to get feedback. At the end of that audience, his jokes will go nowhere, even if they're wonderful. So, Bill, the question is, <clears throat> what sort of energy does the model need to have for you to have a really successful piece at the end of the day? And in a way, it's the same question for all of the artists, because you're looking through the canvas and the canvas is looking back at you. And even though it may be abstract, there may be some element of, of life and energy that you're deriving from that. It's not a living person like Bill. And so that's, that's a question that intrigues me. As an artist, how do you find the feedback of what you're doing to enliven the product that you're going to wind up with? Who wants to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. Okay. <laughs> At one time, a group of us would rent a model and one, e one evening, e evening. And the others were pretty good. Uh, I, okay. And uh, I would uh, work on newsprint. Now, the thing about working on newsprint, totally unforgiving. If you make any mark on it, that's it. You then work with wet watercolour on it and it gets very interesting and exciting. We had this model who was amazing because she could hold these incredible uh, poses for quite a long time. And we uh, do maybe two hours, you know, and eventually got to the end of the evening and it was another pose and she could obviously had enough. <laughs> so she leant back and went like that, which is a very rude posture and I did the best nude I've ever done it's in the house <laughs>
Well, you're right. Uh, the energy of, because I do tend to work with models, the energy of the model and the pose informs my eye. And that's what we all try to glean is something that sparks within what we're trying to accomplish. So for me, I've had, you know, less than satisfactory poses, but that's part of the magic of finding something that sparks my eye, because it's all in the eye. Uh, and that's about the only way I can answer that. I guess can, I, sorry, can I just add something? The, the wonderful thing about a good model, and I'm a great fan of Matisse, because his lines are so beautiful, uh, is that um, they, they create a line that you really, really enjoy, and enjoy to draw. Yeah, I love the piece too. It's, yeah. it's timeless, really. Uh, for me, it's really that energy that is created through the process of making the painting. And I drive Chris nuts. You know, he's like, that painting was done weeks ago. You know, But I have to reach some kind of level or understanding in a painting onto a higher level that comes through the dialogue of actual painting, and that's where that energy comes from. And people always say to me, how do you know when a painting's finished? And my response always is, if you have to ask if it's finished, it's not finished. <laughs> so it's really, you just, just know it eventually when you've reached that level of contemplation for me. Yeah. So I hope that answers your question, Mark. I'm getting to that. I'm getting <laughs> you, you know, this can be an ongoing dialogue. I'm getting feedback from yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thanks so much thanks. for coming. This is great. And uh, champagne outside. Help yourself and lots of snacks here. And enjoy the work. Thank you. Thank you.